Welcome back to the Amiga 600. Last time we got this one working. Well, it was working. We just recapped it and fixed a couple of broken clips on the case. This one over here though, well, this is my Amiga 600. That other one actually belongs to another guy and yes, I need to get it back to him. Other than the obvious missing keycaps, we discovered last time that this one also has no composite video. There's no audio output and we have no right hand mouse button or second joystick button input. It'll probably also need a recap. So let's take out the screw. There's only one in it. We'll take that out and let's see what we can do. We're also missing the trapdoor. One screw. What secrets do you hold? Disconnect the LEDs. Just disconnect the keyboard for now. That was another problem, wasn't it? Some of the keys on this keyboard didn't work. And we'll just put this out of the way. Hey, we get a free IDE cable and a CF card adapter. <laughs> I have seen photos of this before. I have never experienced this for myself. We don't need to recap it. Someone has already done it. Right, okay. Let's just ignore that for a minute and take the floppy drive out. So yeah, someone has had a go, haven't they? So honestly, I have no idea why anyone would do this. I know there is that theory that surface mount soldering is difficult. And probably about a year ago, I would have agreed with you. But the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And I would say now that surface mount soldering is probably easier than through hole. It's certainly quicker. And the amount of time it would take you to do this, you know, having to bend the legs, cut everything, the amount of time it would take to do this, it would be a lot quicker just to put the surface mounted parts on. And while someone has gone to the trouble of doing this, we are going to remove them and put the correct capacitors back in their place. In fact, speaking of time, I wonder how long it took to do that. They have obviously run out of room when fitting this capacitor and they've got rather creative there, haven't they? And how they have bent and twisted those legs to make this fit. But at least we won't have to use the hot air to remove these. I think I will just use the solder and iron and we should be able just to melt the solder either side and just lift them. They should come off relatively easily. And I'm just noticing here actually that the audio jacks must have been off as well. There's a big blob of solder just in there beside the white audio jack. And in fact, if you maybe remember to last time, I thought that jack looked a bit twisted. And that is probably the reason why I think that has been off before. So again, maybe that explains our audio problem. Maybe there's something broken in the round here. I think the first thing we should do is I'll just remove the motherboard from the bottom of the case here and we will just get stuck in to replacing these capacitors. Get all the old ones off. Well, we'll get all the through hole parts that should be surface mounted parts. We'll take all those off. There actually is only two through hole capacitors on this board, there and there. That one definitely looks as if it's been replaced. And I suppose that one as well. I'm not sure actually. You know what, I have replacement caps for everything. Let's just do the whole thing. I found more surprises hiding on the bottom of the board. Someone has patched a trace here. That is on the audio. There's a trace running down here between those two points. So presumably that has broken. I don't see any damage to it though. And curiosity has got the better of me. So let's just cut that. 
And let's just see if that actually is broken. Okay, nothing wrong there. There's been a little bit of damage here to the solder mask, but it looks as if it's just the coating has came off exposing copper and someone has painted something over the top of it, possibly a bit of clear nail varnish. So the plan for getting these off is really straightforward. I have this slightly bigger tip on the iron now. I can just heat up both pods with this at the same time. And just lift the capacitor away. I can smell electrolytic. So while it has been recapped, it hasn't been cleaned. Yeah, that is quite potent actually. So let me get all these capacitors off and then we'll give the board a good going over with some IPA. Well, that was the quickest desoldering job I have ever done. So the next thing to do really is to go around and clean up all those pads. There's loads of excess solder on a lot of them. So we'll wick all that up, but we are gonna have to get the desoldering station out because to fit the two in here, as usual, I want to remove the keyboard connector and I'll just remove the audio jacks because with no sound anyway, so I want to get them out so that I can inspect around it better. I don't think there's any need to remove the IDE header this time. Look at that. Q653, it's sitting at a funny angle and it almost looks as if the top of it is melted. We'll have to check that out. What does Q653 do? But before we worry about that, let's continue cleaning up. Just finished cleaning and uh, I may have discovered why we have no audio. There's also a couple of dodgy looking vias and traces over here. So potentially a cause for are missing inputs or missing buttons. Not sure, I'll need to check that bit out. But in terms of the audio, well, you can see a few pods are missing, especially on the bottom. And while someone did put a jumper wire between there and there, well, if the trace coming to that was broke, no amount of jumpers between there and there would have made any difference. Although when we did cut it, we did notice there was continuity. But nothing to say that continuity at that point wasn't already broken. Equally the same there, if you remember that was just a big blob of solder. When I removed all that, there was nothing to be found. You can see the outline of where two pods were on a trace connecting them. So when we do put the audio jacks back in, we'll just have to run a couple of patch wires from that resistor there and from that capacitor there. As for the damage up here, well, there are a couple of vias there that look very black. And there's a couple of traces that I'm not sure if they're broken or not, but the solder mask on them is certainly stained, like a dark green or almost black color in places. But before we go picking at any of that, let's pull up the Amiga PCB Explorer and see if we can figure out if any of those are related to our missing button inputs. So no, it has nothing to do with our missing buttons. We'll come back to those in a minute. But the trace that is heavily corroded is this one here. So let me select it there. And you can see that is denoted as AV negative. What is that possibly doing? Well, if I select the other side of this capacitor, that is doing the audio. The other bit of corrosion around one of the vias is actually from this point here to a via just here. That is carrying the audio signal. Now, could that possibly be the reason why we have no audio? Okay, there is damage up here, but could this be another reason? Well, if we test it with the multimeter in continuity, that first trace that is slightly corroded well, that buzzes out okay. And then from this point here, it runs through the via there, right across the board, 
to this sort of location here. There are two vias there. And as you can see, that is also fine. So nothing broken here, causing any of our problems. That said though, I will just tidy up where that bit of corrosion is. We'll just go over quickly with the fiberglass pen. And if need be, we can apply a little bit of nail polish should any of the copper get exposed. But what about our two missing buttons? Well, there may be a connection here between the missing buttons and the missing audio. And that connection may be Paula. See, if we look at the pinout for an Amiga mouse or joystick, pin 9 is the right hand mouse button. If we come back to the Amiga PCB Explorer, well, that is pin 9 of the mouse port. That is pin 9 of the joystick port. You can see those are routed through to the other side of the board. So let's just flip to the bottom. There they are there. There's a capacitor on the ground, so I'm not worried about that. There's also a 68 ohm resistor. There's that capacitor again. There's the 68 ohm resistor again. And if we go back to the top side, you can see that both of those signals wind up on Paula. Paula, which I may add, for anyone who doesn't know, is the Amiga's sound chip. So we can test connectivity here as well. So pin 9. Through to Paula there, and that's fine. Although it's only reading 47 ohms. The schematic says 68. Equally on the mouse port. You can see we do have connectivity again, but again, it's only 47 ohms. But on the bottom of our revision 2D board here, well, you can see that that is a 47 ohm resistor. It's the same on both coming from pin nine. Let's just assume there is nothing wrong with that. So could our missing buttons and our missing audio all be down to a bad Paula? There is obviously the damage here that we need to fix. So I think, the next thing that I'll do is let's repopulate all the capacitors. We'll repair the bit of damage up here. And then we can test the board again just to see if we get any audio back. Just going to go over these couple of dull looking traces here with the fiberglass pen. Just want to try and get what looks like that wee bit of corrosion off them. So that looks a bit better now. Any of the dull sort of solder mask is gone and has exposed the copper there on several of those traces. So we will just give that a bit of a going over with some clear nail polish just to protect them again. But with that tidied up like that, well, you can see clearly that there is no breaks in anything. Everything is fine, just like it tested. So new capacitors on and let's continue testing. I've installed about half of the caps and we have the two audio jacks back in. Just in the middle of doing the patch wires that we need. You need to take one from that zero ohm resistor there up to and between those two legs. And then we'll take one from that capacitor up to that leg and across to there. But I noticed someone has tried to reflow some of these capacitors and resistors here before. Some of that solder work is quite untidy so we will have to go over that as well. And that could be a little bit neater. I'm talking about untidy solder work. And look at the state of mine. Yeah, it's a bit better looking. And just while we're at it, a little bit of flux down this side. Let's just reflow those couple of points. There, that looks a bit better. Back on the top side, it's just the surface mount caps in this area to fit, and then all the through hole ones. But just before doing that, I have reflowed several of these components here. The solder joints on the likes of those resistors, that one, the video encoder, they all looked a bit rough. So give them a quick clean with the fiberglass pen, bit of IPA, and then just reflowed everything. Q653 as well, remember it looked a bit dodgy it was sitting at a funny angle well remove that and i've refitted it correctly and just in case you're wondering it does test okay so 
So despite the fact that it might look a little bit melted, it seems to be working fine. So next job, just get the rest of those caps on and then we can test things again. It looks a million times better already with all those correct capacitors now fitted. But let's see if simply doing that resolved any of our problems. Still works. That's a good thing. Right, Amiga test kit. Where will we start? How about the audio? We have audio. That is fantastic. So perhaps the problem was just the damage here. Or maybe it was those caps. Who knows? But it's making noises. That is a win. At least we know there's nothing wrong with Paula. Although, if that is the case, then why does the input over here not work? That said, it might work now. Let's just test that quickly. Left hand mouse button, that works. What about the right? No, that is still not working. Back to audio. What about our low pass filter? Let's just test that. So excuse the squeal, but if I turn on that and then turn on the low pass filter, it should go silent. And it sort of tries to there, does it? It's coming in and out. Let me just turn that off again because that is very annoying. That would suggest to me that we still have something wrong, perhaps a dodgy solder joint somewhere. Just while we are testing things, let me hook up composite to see if there's any signs of life there now. Okay, and if I change the input on the video capture device. Nope, we have no signal. So still something wrong with the composite. Still something wrong with our right hand mouse button input. And it seems we now also have something wrong with the low pass filter. Considering that we have the audio mostly working, let's see if we can just finish that off. Let's see if we can fix whatever this problem is with that filter. So the filter lives in this area here. It is controlled by these two components. In fact, if we jump over to the schematic, I can show you this better. So that is those two components there and there. Q321 and Q331. Those are JFET transistors, and when a positive voltage is applied to the gate of these, that's that bottom pin, that allows current to flow freely between the source and the drain. So when these are turned on, when there's a positive voltage applied to the gate, that is the filter off. When you apply a negative voltage to the gate, that stops current flowing across here, and that is the filter on. Our problem seems to be that the filter is cutting in and out and because it seems to be affecting both channels at the same time my guess is that our fault lies before these two JFETs. Our fault must lie in this part of the schematic here. This circuitry here is responsible for switching the gate of these. It is this transistor Q341 that is doing the switching. That is that transistor in the middle. But because our fault is intermittent I'm not so sure that we have a failed component here. Rather, I think the fault is more likely to be a bad solder joint. So I'm just going to apply a lot of flux to these components around here. And we're just going to reflow this whole area. In fact, before we jump in and do any reflowing, let's just take a quick look, first of all, at what the voltage is coming to the gates of both these JFETs. So let me go into the audio test again. We'll just leave it on the music though, and the low pass filter is off. So we should have a positive voltage coming to these. And yep, that is what we see. Now, if I turn the low pass filter on, what we should see is a negative voltage. But as you can see, it doesn't change stays a positive voltage and around 3 volts. Let's just turn it off again. Yeah, no difference. So that is the problem, isn't it? Our JFETs are not being switched. 
so the filter is permanently off. But because it is intermittent, because it does seem to work that odd time, I think it is just going to be a bad solder joint somewhere. So let's just reflow this area here. But while getting ready to do this, I did notice something else. We have lots of nice new capacitors. Apart from the one that I missed, of course, there's a 10 UF cap that needs to go here. It sits on the AV reference signal. That's just the voltage that drives the audio system. So that may have something to do with our filter problem. Although I wouldn't be 100% sure of that. Rather, while testing the audio, I did hear a bit of noise in it. And that missing capacitor might be responsible for that. So we'll fit that, but just want to reflow this whole area as well. Just going to do part of the underside of the board as well. There's a few crusty looking solder joints here that I didn't see earlier. It's not as bad down here, but we'll just reflow those few components there anyway. I can smell a little bit of electrolytic there coming from this area, in particular those three components there. Yeah, that's a bit smelly. So a good clean for this area as well, I think. In fact, there's even a via there that looks a bit suspect. So I just want to go over that with the fiberglass pen. There, let's clean that up a bit. But let's see if I can get some fresh solder to flow into that via. Just in case there was any chance of damage internally there. Okay, I'm gonna tidy it all up and then we'll test it again. So, let me make a test kit. Audio. Certainly sounds as if it is playing okay. What is the voltage level at the gate of our two JFETs? So again, very similar to what we've seen last time. What about if we turn on the low pass filter now? The audio does sound as if it's filtered. What is our voltage level? Yeah, that's more like it. Negative 11. Negative 11. Well, 11.5 odd. That is exactly what we would have expected to see. So we'll just turn it off. Let's go around to the 10 kilohertz square wave and apologies again for the squeal. But if I press this, yeah, it's working. Fantastic. Another problem solved. Must have just been bad solder joint in around here somewhere, as I suspected. Or maybe it was that missing capacitor, but I don't think so. So next problem, right hand mouse button or button to input from the joystick. Controller ports, left mouse button works, right mouse button works. What? Um, what? Hi. Let's just see. Left button, button two. What's going on here? <laughs> so it's just magically fixed itself? What? Yeah, that now seems to be fine. How did that happen? The signals from them do get rooted up towards this sort of area and then across. Well, one of them does anyway. The one from the mouse port comes up here and comes through a via there across to Paula, which I think is that one there. But I didn't reflow that. And certainly the other one from the joystick port, it doesn't come anywhere near this area. I am confused, but then again, don't complain. It seems to have resolved itself. 
just wiggling that there just in case you know it is another dodgy joint somewhere can we upset it to stop this working it doesn't seem so okay well that was an easy fix just do nothing what about the composite though can we get it sorted so composite video or lack thereof what is composite video well it's just the luma and chroma signals smashed together and forced out that yellow jack that's the job of the video encoder to create the composite signal well not only the video encoder actually because it's that in conjunction with these things and it seems that these cans are a particularly common failure point so let's see if that is indeed the problem and if so let's try and figure out which one has failed now if we take a quick look at the schematic u12 that is our video encoder you can see chroma out and luma out on pins 15 and 16. they go through these sets of cans z221 and z222 those three are 222 that one on its own is 221 and then they come back to the video encoder on pins 17 and 18. now these things are just a coil so they should measure as a dead short with the meter and going back to the schematic again if we look at the luma signal well it's coming out of pin 16 through a 1k resistor goes through the coils and then back into pin 18. so if we measure between pin 16 and 18 on this we should see 1k of resistance and nope it is open circuit so i reckon we have a break in here somewhere internally one of one or all of these have failed i can't do this test with the other one because if you look at the schematic again there are capacitors sitting in line with it although this thing itself we could measure on it couldn't we between pins one and three let me flip this over and those two pins there are one and three and yeah that is dead short between them so that one is okay in fact can we figure out of those other three which one has the break so that's pin one there in the middle next one up is pin five and that should be a short which it is there's then a trace on the other side that brings us up to there which is pin 10 which should be shorted through to there pin 11 and it's not so i think that is our problem let me just see if i could trace the rest of that out then from pin 11 we should have connectivity to pin 18 well, there's a trace there so yeah we do and to this pin here pin 3 which we don't so there's another failure so it seems we have a problem there and there which is those two cans now i don't think you can get replacements for these but one thing you can do is get a replacement video encoder that does not require these and in fact it also gives a slightly better picture i of course don't have one so that might have to wait for another time but since these won't be required let's just remove those two faulty ones anyway just to see if we can even confirm internally inside these that they have indeed failed well that is two things learnt number one being those aren't three individual components rather it is one component the second thing would be that you have no chance not a snowball's chance in hell of trying to take those apart and repair them now i think some people have managed to do it before in the past but there is no way i could do it i don't even know how you'd start to get them apart because they are crimped here on both sides so you'd need to try and bend that out somehow to pull out the innards of it without damaging anything i just don't even think it's worth the time to be honest but it's soaking wet the bottom of it as is the board certainly up this end here and it is soaking wet with spilt electrolytic mess so i clean up this bit anyway but we'll just leave the rest of that for now rgb works fine that's pretty much all i'll ever use out of this machine anyway i'm not really that worried about the composite although for all it is i think i will order the replacement video encoder and 
we'll maybe come back to this board when I get that chip to carry out that modification because it's not just swapping the encoder there's a few other bits you need to change as well so all that's really left to do today is to repopulate this we need to put the keyboard connector back on then put it all back in the case and give it one more test so just about to refit the top of the case with the keyboard but taking a look at this ribbon cable is it any wonder the keyboard is starting to fail not sure if you'll be able to make it out on the camera or not but the contacts on the end of this are more or less worn away and like carbon contacts on it and there's just big deep scratches in them from where this has been in and out of the connector and it's worn right through to the plastic backing in places so is it any wonder it's not making connectivity about the only thing that i can think to do will be to cut that off peel this blue layer back and hopefully that will fix it you know what i'm not even sure i'm not sure that i haven't damaged that further but look let's just try it there's actually a couple of Amiga 600 keyboards on eBay at the minute. Fairly cheap. I know I'm missing keys off this, but I am tempted just to buy a complete replacement keyboard for it. But let's try this. And I absolutely detest this stupid wire from the LEDs trying to get it connected to the board. It feels like it's about to snap off. So let's boot back to Amiga Test Kit one more time. Let's try the keyboard. No, not looking good. Yeah, more or less all of it isn't working. Time for a new keyboard. But at least the audio is working nicely now with the low pass filter. And let's just see, do we still have a right hand mouse button? Yep, yeah, that is working fine. Complete mystery, but it's working fine. Well, I still got a bit more work to do to this 600. Need to get a keyboard, need to get that other video encoder chip so that we can fix the composite. For now though, we've got the audio problem fixed and the right hand mouse button, second joystick button input that seemed to fix itself. If anyone has any ideas as to how that happened, please let me know. But in the meantime, I think that'll do for this video. So if you enjoyed what you've seen, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already? Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG, and I'll see you next time.